Monday, Thursday. Monday, as in mandate, as in commandment, as in the last set of instructions Jesus gave to his disciples on the very last Thursday evening of his earthly life. And what were those instructions? They were to love one another as he loved us. And then he went on to speak and to show meaningful ways to love, incredible ways to love, beginning with Thursday, continuing through Friday, and the rest of Saturday, and a shock on Sunday. But for now, we're on Thursday, and he gave us memory devices. He gave us words. He gave us gospel. We hear it tonight, four stories woven together from four gospels into the readings for Holy Week. And then that fabulous memory device by offering us Holy Communion, the Last Supper, an opportunity to always gather in his name and to always, always remember him and to take his words and his actions to heart. If you haven't already, please make sure that you get for yourself a bit of bread, a bit of drink, and bring it to the screen. You are bringing it to the table, where in a little while we'll consecrate it, we will partake together, and we will have remembered. In the meantime, let us settle ourselves, let us settle our hearts into an attitude that is worthy of Jesus Christ. And let us prepare our hearts and our minds to worship.
Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover meal for us that we may eat it. And they asked him, well, where do you want us to make preparations for it? Listen, he said to them, when you've entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks you, where's the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He'll show you a large room upstairs already furnished. Make preparations for us there. So they went and found everything Nicaea told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Then the hour came and he took his place at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. A dispute also rose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. But Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. Not so with you. Rather, the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like one who serves. For who's greater, the one who's at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. During supper, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, he got up from the table and he took off his outer robe and he tied a towel around himself. And then he poured water into a basin. And he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus answered, you do not know now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. And Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, well, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. So Simon Peter said to him, well, then, Lord, not, not my feet only, but, but my hands and my head. And Jesus said to him, well, one who is bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, but he's entirely clean. And you are clean, although not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. And for this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe and returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that's what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know who I have chosen, but it's to fulfill the scripture. The one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I tell you this now before it occurs so that when it does occur, you may believe that I am he. Very truly, I tell you, whoever receives one whom I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. So as they were eating, Jesus said, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me, one who's eating with me. And they began to be distressed and say to him, one after another, well, surely it's not I, it's not I, not me. And he said to them, it, it's, it's one of the 12, 
It's one of the twelve who is dipping the bowl with me this evening. For the Son of Man goes as is written of him, but woe to that one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he was speaking. One of his disciples, the one whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him, and Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. And so while reclining next to Jesus, he asked, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, well, it's the one to whom I give this piece of bread that I have dipped in the dish. So when he had dipped the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. And after he received the piece of bread, Satan entered into him. And Jesus said to him, do quickly what you're going to do. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the common purse, Jesus was telling him, buy what you need for the festival, or, or that he should maybe go give something to the poor. So after receiving the piece of, piece of bread, Judas immediately went out, and it was night. And when he had gone out, Jesus said, now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified with him. A few months ago, I was preparing to offer Holy Communion on a Sunday morning, and there was a mishap. Um, we were in the throes of the pandemic then, and we were trying, we're still trying, uh, we're trying hard to figure out how to offer meaningful worship services in spite of all the challenges. And so we had begun using those little pre-packaged communion kits that we hand out to folks who come uh, and physically worship in the parking lot. Kits that meet our safety needs and we're grateful for them, but kits that seem to us a little artificial, uh, a little bit like fast food, um, a little bit like a parody of the Eucharist. Uh, even though, even though you know that's not our intention. 
But so because of this, I found myself wanting to do something to bring more, I don't know, more dignity to the moment, um, even, even if it was only from my own sense of decorum. And so I hit upon this idea of putting all of those little plastic cups inside a, a beautiful crystal serving bowl. Um, I thought that might be my way of sanctifying the elements, I guess. I wanted the communion elements to seem a lot less like Lunchables and far more, um, far more sacramental. And so on that Sunday morning, from my own china cabinet, I pulled a special cut glass bowl. It had been a wedding gift. Um, it had been a fixture during family table gatherings for 33 years. And so I, I wrapped it up, I cradled it in, in bubble wrap, and I gingerly transported it across the street from the parsonage to the church building and went into the kitchen where I filled it up with all those little plastic cups. Um, and it was all ready to be consecrated. And as I maneuvered carefully from the church kitchen toward the sanctuary, those of you who know the building, you know the route I had to take. And so as I was carrying the bowl in front of me, I went through the swinging fellowship hall doors, swung it out, started to step, to step through the doorway, and that swinging door rudely swung back on me, crashed into the bowl, broke it, demolished it. I was so stunned. Uh, it took me a few minutes to, to catch my bearings, and, and I stared at the broken bowl, and I stared at the glass shards that were now covering the contents of the broken bowl, and, and the efficient part of my brain said, worship is in 30 minutes, you need another plan. And the sentimental part of my brain sent the signal uh, to let my eyes tear up a little bit. But the theological part of my brain said, wow, what a metaphor. So here it is, something precious, something of personal value, something broken. Broken in the very midst of conveying something profound about God. Broken in the very midst of glorifying God. Jesus, broken for you, broken for me. Jesus, willingly broken for you, broken for me. Jesus, willingly broken for you, for me, because he knows we are broken. Jesus, willingly broken for you and for me, because he knows we are broken and we are in need of restoration. On the day this bowl was broken, I mentioned it to someone, and very practically she said, well, it's only a bowl. And indeed, that's true. But still, the brokenness um, caused me a, a smidge of emotional pain, I have to say. Not for the thing that it was, but, but for the memories it held. Each shard representing a beloved person or a significant moment. And then each jagged edge, uh, each of those representing a, a disappointment, a failure, a loss. Some of those jagged edges call to mind that the moments that were lousy for me as a person were sometimes the moments when I cut myself off from God's goodness, from living with more fear than faith, more sin than grace, more inward focus than expansive love. Jesus' brokenness will become ever more jagged as we take in more of his story tonight and tomorrow, and as we wrestle and rest with the horror of his demise before we can come to know joy on the other side. Before we move forward to that, we need to take some time to contemplate our own brokenness, our own jaggedness, 
staring down the hurts we have experienced and the hurts we have caused knowingly or circumstantially. If it helps to stay focused, I would invite you to pick up paper and pen and write these things down as they come to you or just keep them in your mind and your heart. But take a few moments. Music will play while you take time to be thoughtful. And this will be each worshiper's confession this evening. Join me at Jesus' table. Bring your bread and your drink. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, and he gave it to them. And he said, take, eat. This is my body. After, he took the cup and he gave thanks. And he gave it to them and he said, drink from this, 
This is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for men. And Jesus said, truly, I tell you, I'll never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. By all the merits of your life, by your humility, meekness, and patience, by your griefs and sorrows, by your prayers and tears, by your having been despised and rejected, by your atoning death, by your divine presence, by the holy sacraments, bless and comfort us, gracious Lord and God. Amen. And Jesus said, little children, I'm with you only a little longer. You'll look for me. And as I said to the Jews, now I say to you, where I'm going, you can't come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus answered, where I'm going, you can't follow me now but you will follow afterward. And Peter said to him, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I'll lay down my life for you. And Jesus answered, will you lay down your life for me? Truly, I tell you, before the cock crows, you will have denied me three times. And Peter said to him, even though I must die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all the disciples. Jesus responded, <laughs> Simon, hey, Simon, listen. Satan has demanded to sift all of you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your own faith may not fail, and you, when once you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. And Jesus said to them, when I send you out without a purse, bag, or sandals, when I did that, did you lack anything? And they said, no not a thing and he said to them but now the one who has a purse must take it and likewise a bag and, and the one who has no sword must sell his cloak and buy one for i tell you this scripture must be fulfilled in me that he was counted among the lawless and indeed what is written about me is being fulfilled and they said lord look here are two swords he replied, it is enough. Later that evening, Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. And he said to them, I'm deeply grieved even to death. Stay here, stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and he prayed, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. And then an angel from heaven appeared to him and gave him strength. In his anguish, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down on the ground. Then he came back to his disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not stay awake with me just one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away for the second time and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again, he came and found him sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. 
And so leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came back to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? <sighs> See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let's be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. And while he was still speaking, Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees. And they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. And then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, whom are you looking for? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. And again, he asked them, whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I kiss, that'll be the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. And then they laid hands on Jesus and arrested him. Suddenly one of those with Jesus put his hand on his sword, drew it and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scripture be fulfilled, which say it must happen this way? At that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were a bandit? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you didn't arrest me. But all this has taken place so that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. Then all of the disciples deserted him. They fled. A certain young man was following him, wearing nothing but a linen cloth. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth and ran off. 